There was a lot to like about the Rugrats when it first came out. The fun, upbeat theme music, the interesting character design, the jokes that I didn't understand, but I laughed anyways because I knew what a joke sounded like. Excuse me, bro. My tax deductions are crying. Even the animation style, those squiggly, ever-moving lines invoked in me a feeling that the boundaries between things were not so stern, a worldview that seemed less certain about its surroundings, much like the babies that occupied it. But Rugrats was a show that was exceptional, not only because of the nostalgia factor or its financial success, or because we're getting a reboot that is live action somehow, but because the central theme of the show, empathy for people who are different than us, is something that we need more than ever today. Wow, that was like, that was like really like deep and heartfelt. <laughs> uh, who am I, Mikey Newman? <laughs> I'm nothing like Mikey. He's so positive, and I bet everyone loves him. He's got a hundred thousand subscribers. Plus he's got this flashy After Effects intro. Ugh, I never learned After Effects. I'll never be good enough. Yeah, Mikey! But since Mikey did challenge people to make videos about what we learned from animation, and I never turned down a challenge, and that's why I once ate so many warheads that my taste buds literally split in half, it turns out my brother didn't even put his warheads in his mouth, you were there in his hand the whole time. I thought to myself, well... A baby's gotta do what a baby's gotta do. In the 1980s, broadly speaking, there were two types of kids' entertainment. Garbage pumped out by toy companies hoping to sell stuff to unwitting children, and Sesame Street. I had a whole section here about Reagan and the deregulation of children's programming in the 80s, but Lindsay Ellis covered this in a recent video, so I'll just say, try sitting through more than a few minutes of an original Transformers episode. They're unwatchable. Booking up another sleazy scheme, huh, Megatron? What's that? Something the Easter Bunny brought you? Sesame Street was the exception because it had years of research and child psychology behind it. I think it's fair to say that by the time our program goes on the air, it will be the most thoroughly researched show in the history of the medium. In developing the show, doctors and teachers studied how kids learn to create a show tailored to inner city kids whose educational needs may not be met by poorly funded schools. The short, simple, 60 second form used by TV advertisers in commercials to sell products is used here to teach numbers and letters. While all this was going on, Nickelodeon found some success in the 80s as the first US television network aimed directly at kids. But aside from running a few syndicated cartoons, their content was primarily live action because of the tremendous cost of animation. Hey, dude. By 1990, Nickelodeon was successful enough that they could afford to greenlight their own cartoons, which they called Nicktoons. In stepped husband and wife duo Gabor Chupo and Arlene Klasky, whose animation company worked on the original shorts and first three seasons of The Simpsons. How does it feel to be a hero, Bart? Pretty damn good, Phil. Chupo and Klasky came up with a weird and wonderful show called The Rugrats, based on their experience raising their own children. It became one of the longest running Nicktoons of all time until a pineapple under the sea stole a secret Krabby Patty formula. After animator and producer Arlene Klasky had her second child, she decided to stay home and watch her children full time. But the whole time I was there, there would be things that I would be working on at home and we wanted to pitch some things, some projects to Sesame Street because we thought they do very cool things and sure. um, creative things. While at home watching her children discover the world, she saw humor and intelligence. If babies could speak, what would they say? And the main impetus was that we had to shut the bathroom door <laughs> so that they wouldn't try to get in the bathroom to stick his hands in the toilet. She started to think about things from their perspective. She realized that she wanted to create characters around the question, how do these babies see the world? If you didn't have teeth and you bit your tongue, it would hurt. And from Arlene putting herself in her child's shoes came a show that captured just how empathy can help bridge gaps between two different worlds. When I sneak out of my room late at night, who's sleeping with a TV on so I can watch it? Grandpa? Right. He's the neatest grown up there is. And now he needs us. We gotta help him. Rugrats invited me to empathize with these tiny weirdos with big heads in a way that other shows didn't. Whereas most kids shows try to cast cooler, older characters so that their younger audience feels like they're hanging out with the cool kids, Rugrats title characters were far younger than that of the target audience of 2 to 11 year olds. 
This show invites young kids to think of babies not just as whiny little humans who poop all the time, but as tiny people with rich emotional lives. As someone who has had the privilege of writing narrative content for a younger demographic, I understand how hard it can be to make something that's fun and funny while also making sure it has something deeper to say. Even though to some adults it may just seem like poo and pee based humor. Poo and the show is designed not only to make us feel empathy for the babies, but empathy is also in play within the narrative as the parents, children, and grandparents try their best to understand one another, even if they can't always communicate verbally. The running joke where Dee Dee tries to use the advice of child psychologist Dr. Lipschitz, let's see what the book says, emphasizes that not only do parents not quite get the children, but even the parents and grandparents disagree on child rearing techniques. The show is like one giant web of well-meaning miscommunication. Like the internet, if the internet had a shred of empathy. <sighs> Nevertheless, the adults are always trying their best to understand and take care of the babies, and the babies are always trying to understand and experience the adult world. This emphasis on empathy is part of the reason that Angelica is the perfect antagonist for the show, but we'll get to her later. First. A core empathetic element of the Rugrats, which in my opinion is sorely missing in modern mainstream culture, is male-male friendship. Most narratives feature a sole, heroic male lead. Maybe he'll have a sidekick, but sidekick relationships are by definition almost never equal or emotionally supportive. They're more transactional, like a boss-employee relationship, or hierarchical, like a father-son thing. Let's get going and make an emergency bat turn. Not this time, old chum. Have to think of the golfers. The retro rockets would burn up the course for a hundred yards. But Tommy and Chucky love each other. And I mean love with capital letters, the type of love and affection that is more common to see between two female friends. Tommy and Chucky love each other without any fear of no homo. It's sad that just this small touch of male-male friendship seems subversive. And even though Chucky is arguably Tommy's sidekick, they need each other equally. There's even an episode where Chucky sees what his life would look like if he had never been born. And we learn that although Tommy is the brave one who protects Chucky, Tommy's courage is very much a result of his relationship with Chucky. The only reason he's so brave is that he has you around to back him up. Having a friend like you gives Tommy the guts to stand up to bullies like Angelica. Without you, He's just another broken down baby bubbing cookie crumbs. The Rugrats movie increases the stakes over the TV show. Although Tommy often acts as his best friend Chucky's caretaker, within Tommy's immediate family he has always been the center of attention since he was an only child. But when Tommy's little brother Dill is born, Tommy is confronted with the terrible reality that his mom and dad now see Dill as a higher priority than Tommy. Please stop. Don't you see? I want mom and dad for me. Tommy still just wants his mom and dad all to himself. In a moment where Stu empathizes with his son, Tommy, about the hardships of having a younger brother. But sometimes little brothers, they, they aren't everything you'd hope they'd be. That's why big brothers have got to have faith. He also tells Tommy about responsibility by giving him a family heirloom, a gold watch. But since Tommy doesn't have a firm grasp of spoken English and doesn't have much life experience, he doesn't get it yet. Instead of grasping the complicated idea of responsibility, or as he calls it, my responsibility, he mistakes a clock for a compass. The lesson goes over Tommy's head, and as the story progresses, Dill, a helpless baby who requires even more constant care than Chucky, really gets on Tommy's nerves. You didn't leave any for me! I need some lanky too. At the climax of the film, Tommy rejects his responsibility, literally and symbolically, by tossing away the watch. I'm through being your big brother! I don't want my responsibility no more! And then starts dumping banana baby food on Dill to feed him to the monkeys in a tragic Shakespearean moment. But Tommy stops when he looks down and sees the tears in Dill's helpless eyes. The shot then pans over to a puddle so that we, the audience, see Tommy's anger fade and turn to sympathy. 
In seeing Dill's face, we are invited to empathize with the weaker of the two babies, and in seeing Tommy's face, we are invited to empathize with the stronger of the two babies. The similarity between their faces suggests that they are symbolically the same person at two different stages in their life. It's a subtle way of telling us, remember how there was a time when you didn't have all the answers? So maybe when you get upset at someone, don't try to get a bunch of monkeys to commit murder for you. In that moment, Tommy finally understands and accepts the responsibility of becoming a caretaker and an older brother, retrieves his watch, and as they fall asleep, Dill pulls her torn blanket from earlier over Tommy, symbolically repairing the relationship that had been broken. That is some heavy imagery for a film that features Buster Rhymes as a Godzilla stand-in. I am Raptor! One visual motif that we see pretty often in Rugrats, in the opening sequence of the TV show, and repeatedly in the film, is mirrors. In film theory, there is this concept borrowed from psychoanalysis called the mirror stage. It's a little outdated now, but put very simply, it's when a baby looks into a mirror and starts gaining the realization that they are not the center of the universe, but part of a larger social and symbolic order within and against which the individual is constantly trying to define her or his identity. Over the course of the movie, Tommy's identity shifts from only child to big brother, and he starts taking on the responsibilities associated with that relationship. But not simply because it's a role to fill, not simply because daddy said do this thing, you can't just be ordered to feel empathy. Instead, Tommy takes on those responsibilities by choice, because through life experience he has learned empathy for Dill. Despite being assigned different genders at birth, Phil and Lil have the same love of bugs, grossness, and toughness. You started that fight! No, you started it, Lillian! The creators could have chosen to make Phil love snips and snails and puppy dog tails, and to make Lil love sugar, spice, and everything nice, but the creators chose to make them peas in a pod, which is a much more realistic, powerful, and positive portrayal and deconstructs traditional male-female roles in kids' cartoons. Phil and Lil are a vehicle for us to better understand gender identity and gender expression, to feel and understand that gender is a construct. My ribbon! Phil and Lil also play directly into this by often switching identities. With a simple bow exchange, Phil is able to present female to the world, and none of the parents blink an eye. It feels like the kids get that gender is just this made-up thing that parents are weirdly concerned with. How did, if you had one of each, you'd realize how different boys and girls really are and emphasizes how gender is constructed and assigned by parents and society, and how it's forced on children. The idea that a little bow proves femininity to the parents is delightfully absurd. <laughs> oh, poor little boy. I know what's wrong. Why she call him Lil Phil? Oh no, Chucky. She thinks Lil is Phil. Here to talk more about Phil and Lil is my old friend Lindsay Amer, activist plus creator and host of Queer Kid Stuff. Phil and Lil's frequent bow swapping is pretty unique even though gender swapping in itself isn't uncommon in animation. Within fandoms, it's known as Rule 63. According to Rule 63, there exists an opposite gender counterpart of every fictional character. But when someone gender swaps a character, whether it's in the canon of the show itself or in a fan drawing, it tends to get pretty exaggerated. Aladdin gets high cheekbones and a dress, and Ariel gets pecs and a six pack. Phil and Lil are already drawn nearly identically despite their gender difference, and all they have to do is pass the bow to make the swap. Their androgyny gives them a fluidity and control over their gender expression that we don't typically see. As a very androgynous kid myself who is frequently misgendered male, I really appreciate how Phil and Lil have the ability to control how the adults around them perceive their genders to their advantage. Phil and Lil aren't the only ones who grapple with gender roles and clothes. In the episode, Clan of the Duck, Lil tells the boys that only girls wear dresses because girls are good and boys are bad, naughty babies. Oh, that's why. Which, incidentally, she learned at her mom and daughter female empowerment class. Phil and Chucky get just a little bit jealous and try on dresses for themselves. If girls can wear anything they want, then so can we. Come on, Chucky, we're gonna try on a dressy. They wear their dresses for the entire episode. The way they wrote that episode is truly incredible. Phil and Chucky get chased around by these two older boys who don't like that they're wearing dresses. Let's get them. Yeah, boys aren't supposed to be wearing dresses. Run, Chucky! The homophobia and transphobia they get into is pretty intense for a kid's show, but that's what's awesome about Rugrats. Phil and Chucky run into a clan of Scottish babies in kilts because, duh, who ward off the bullies and celebrate the freedom of the dressy. 
Tommy's mom doesn't stop him when he joins the gang in their dress wearing, and that, my friends, is progress. And yes, a lot of little girls like mud. We love it. Needs more water. My best friend growing up wasn't allowed to watch Rugrats because her mother didn't like Angelica's sass, and because Angelica set a bad example. In the writer's room, Angelica created problems too. The creators and the writers disagreed on just how mean to write Angelica. Angelica was based off Gabor's childhood bully, who was a girl. If Angelica were the only female character, or only female baby in Rugrats, then sure, we would definitely have a problem. But she rounds out a large, diverse cast. Nowadays, people are mad that Marvel took so long to cast a female villain. Then when they did cast a female villain, she ended up pretty flat. Angelica is spunky and mean, but also vulnerable. We've all known someone like Angelica, a spoiled brat. What a pretty party dress, Angelica. Thank you. My mommy's assistant bought it especially for my Aunt Dee Dee's party. <laughs> who has a tenuous relationship to the facts. You dumb babies got a lot to learn about the facts of lies. Who routinely demeans everyone around her to make herself feel superior. Hey, you stupid diaper bag! You dumb babies! You know, not all dogs go to heaven. Yeah, we all know someone like that. Dogs are dirty and ugly, not like us. And as I mentioned before, with empathy being a core theme of the show, Angelica's lack of empathy makes her a spectacular antagonist. She's caught between the world of babies and the world of adults, neither of which she fully comprehends. But boy, does she try to act like she does. Angelica, what? What's the Grand Canyon? Not Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon. Don't you know anything? Very fine. <gasps> What's the Grand Canyon? She's selfish and awful and not only seems to lack empathy, but genuinely enjoys causing suffering. Hey, give me back my <laughs> Rugrats also doesn't just show Angelica being mean and then getting her way. She usually gets her comeuppance. The show implies that Angelica inherits some of these behaviors from her high-powered executive mother. There's an alarming crowd at my in-laws indicating either a yard sale or a family tragedy. Let me get back to you. But again, because of the large, diverse cast, the message is never, women shouldn't be powerful executives. It's complicated, it's real, it's family. A lot of the drama in Rugrats comes from Angelica listening to the grown-ups, then turning around and telling the babies a false version of what she heard, intentionally or unintentionally misleading them. At the end of the trial, the jerky guys whisper to each other, then one of the storytellers goes to jail. Now, since I'm the smartest person here, I'm gonna be the persecutor. Why couldn't we be the persecutor? Watch it or I'll make you the jerky. But we, as the audience, are able to grasp the reality of the situation through context clues. This brilliantly teaches children not to take everything at face value and that context matters. Rugrats also gives us a built-in answer to Angelica in the form of lovable Susie Carmichael, one of my favorite characters. Uh, who does Susie Carmichael think she is? The writers made Susie and Angelica incredibly alike. They're charismatic, love performing, take charge, but Susie shows us how to do that in a way that is warm, loving, and doesn't put the babies down for being themselves. You move yourself with these pedals. You move yourself? That's amazing. Yep, you can go anywhere you want. Wow. Oh, and one more thing about Angelica, because I can only imagine what the New York Times would say about it. No, we do not need to empathize with bullies to appease them. It's bullies who need to learn empathy. Rugrats taught children in the 90s to see things with a fresh pair of eyes, like a toddler. It helped us to see that so much of the world around us is absurd or silly or weird. And that maybe we should have some more sympathy and understanding for one another, because there was a time when we needed that same sympathy and understanding for ourselves. Maybe we can all learn something, as they say, from the mouth of babes. And take that, Mikey! I sure showed you with this YouTube video. Wait, maybe Mikey has so many subscribers because he actually puts in a lot of effort and makes awesome videos that mean something. And you know what? I can watch some YouTube videos if I really want to learn After Effects. Mm, no, I'm not going to learn After Effects. You know, maybe we all have a responsibility to learn from each other and take care of one another. 
That's why Mikey came up with this idea of encouraging people to make videos about what we all learned from animation, to bring us all a little closer together. Aw, Mikey. Good night, sweet prince. Thanks for watching, and thanks to all my wonderful patrons who help make it possible for me to create these videos. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash magmayfish, and be sure to check out Lindsay's YouTube channel, Queer Kid Stuff. If you found this video via Lindsay, just be aware that usually my videos aren't so child safe. Subscribe to my channel for more film analysis, follow me on Twitter at magmayfish for updates and jokes, and other cool stuff.